ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining this webinar session on outer space and international law. A webinar co-organized by the NUS Center for International Law, the Attorney General's Chambers of Singapore, and the Economic Development Board Office for Space Technology and Industry. Today's seminar will comprise a panel discussion and a Q&A. Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom window. Allow me to introduce the moderator for today's panel, Dr. Nilifer Oral, the Director of the Center for International Law. Dr. Oral, please. Despite the many times I've done Zoom, I keep forgetting to unmute myself. So thank you so much, uh, Yvette, uh, and welcome to all. Uh, on behalf of the National University of Singapore Center for International Law, it is my great pleasure to welcome you today to this webinar on Outer Space and International Law. I take this opportunity to thank the Attorney General Chambers of Singapore Office and the Singapore Office of Space, Technology and Industry for inviting CIL to join them in organizing this webinar exploring the different aspects of international law of outer space. Today, we have a panel of very distinguished world experts, and I thank each of them for their participation today. Now, when in 1865, the famous French novelist Jules Verne published his novel, From the Earth to the Moon, the notion of building a rocket to go to the moon was pure fantasy. Some 100 years later, in 1969, Apollo 11 made its historic moon landing and the world witnessed Neil Armstrong take those first steps on the moon. Much has happened since 1969 and much I think will continue to happen in this very fascinating area. Space was once the exclusive province of states, but has opened up to private actors, commercial space flights, space tourism, are no longer far-fetched dreams, but reality. So much of our modern life we enjoy are due to the benefits of space technologies, far too many for me to list. However, as outer space opens up, it brings new challenges and issues. For example, in 1967, states adopted the landmark Outer Space Treaty that embodied key principles, notably that the exploration and use of outer space shall be carried out for the benefit and the interests of all countries and shall be the province of all mankind. But what does this mean as space opens up, becomes more democratized, and more and more the province of non-state actors and private interests? Among other issues, like litter that is polluting our oceans, space debris is increasingly also becoming a problem. So today we are most fortunate to have a panel of experts to give us insight into outer space and international law. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce a most remarkable citizen of Singapore, Mr. Peter Ho, to make opening remarks. In the short time I have, I cannot possibly do justice to his amazing career and contribution to the public service of Singapore, but just a few highlights. Uh, Mr. Ho retired in 2010 after a career in the public service stretching more than 34 years. During this time, he held many high level posts. He was head of civil service, concurrent with other appointments, such as permanent secretary of foreign affairs, permanent secretary of the national security and intelligence coordination, permanent secretary special duties in the prime minister's office. Yet Mr. Ho, who may be retired on paper, remains incredibly active serving in various leadership positions today. He is now Senior Advisor to the Center for Strategic Futures, a Senior Fellow in the Civil Service College. In addition to being a member of the Board of Trustees of the National University of Singapore, he serves as Chairman of numerous boards and councils, including the Office for Space Technology and Industry. So without uh, waiting anymore, Mr. Ho, we welcome you to make opening comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oral, and a warm welcome to all of you to this webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us, especially those who are joining from different time zones. 
My name is Peter Ho, and I'm chairman of the Office of Space Technology and Industry, which is Singapore's National Space Office. Although we may not be conscious of it, uh, space plays a central role in our lives today. Like other countries, Singapore depends on space-based technologies and applications that support important functions and everyday life. Singapore is a very small country and a young nation. The space sector is therefore relatively new but there are more than 50 companies in Singapore engaged in a wide range of space-related activities. These range from the design and manufacture of components for space technologies to the provision of satellite-based services. More than 1,000 professionals work in the space sector in engineering, research, and business roles. We hope to grow this nascent but increasingly vibrant space sector tapping into the opportunities of the new space tech economy. Indeed, the new space economy promises exciting possibilities. The space industry is being disrupted by a new generation of entrepreneurs and their ambitions. New business models have led to falling costs in rocket launches. Technological advances are shrinking payloads for space. Micro and nano satellites combined with commercial launches are now putting space within the reach of many more countries. It is in the words of Dr. Oral, the democratization of space. Today, companies like SpaceX and entrepreneurs like Elon Musk are familiar names around the world. There are now hundreds, if not thousands of startups trying to follow in their footsteps. But even as the new space economy has tremendous potential to support the creation of jobs and economic growth, the privatization and commercialization of space activities and the increased space traffic also bring about a new set of challenges, and this includes in space law. Activities such as space tourism and deep space mining, the emergence of large commercial satellite constellations, and challenges like space debris and orbital congestion leading to increased risk of collisions were likely unforeseen when the international legal regime for space was first drawn up in the early 1960s. States are now beginning to confront a new reality in space where previously unforeseen challenges need to be addressed, including through better regulation of space and space-related activities. It is an underappreciated and underdeveloped area of international law that requires urgent thinking and attention as the exploitation of space accelerates in tandem with the technology and with national and commercial ambitions. This webinar provides us with opportunity to hear from eminent experts in the field of space law who will touch on some of these issues. As an emerging space state, these are important issues for Singapore. We recognize that the collective effort of the international community is needed to address these challenges if we are to preserve and ensure sustainable access to outer space for all. And we are taking steps to be part of this important conversation on space law and norms taking place in international fora, for example, Singapore joined the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space as a new member in 2019. We look forward to contributing meaningfully to the global efforts to strengthen the international regime governing outer space activities. Before I conclude, I would like to express my appreciation to our distinguished panelists for joining us today, as well as to the co-organizers of the webinar the Attorney General's Chambers, and the Center for International Law for the efforts in organizing today's webinar. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ho. You have perfectly set the stage uh, for this webinar and for our, the issues that we will be addressing. 
So now what I would like to do is first, I will introduce our panelists. Um, and after I've introduced uh, all of them, then they will individually start with their lectures. And for the audience, we will first allow all presentations to be completed before we take questions and answers. So I hope you will bear with us. Now, each of our panelists are truly world-recognized experts. So I cannot possibly do justice to their CVs in the time we have. So I will highlight just some aspects. Professor Setsuko Aoki is professor of international law at the Keio University Law School in Japan. And she is also vice director of the Keio Center for Space Law. Um, she specializes in public international law, but particularly space law, arms control and expert control. She's the chair of the legal subcommittee of the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space and a member of the Committee on the National Space Policy Cabinet Office of Japan. She has many publications and she will be speaking today on national and regional approaches to the management and regulation of outer space activities. Stephen Freeland is Emeritus Professor of International Law and former Dean of the School of Law at Western Sydney University, Australia. He holds numerous honorary adjunct or visiting appointments at universities around the world. He has advised governments, including representing the Australian government at various UN conferences and meetings. He's been appointed by the United Nations Committee um, on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space to co-lead multilateral discussions among the member states regarding the exploration, exploitation, and utilization of space resources. He is also director of the pa Paris Space International Institute of Space Law. Um, amazing, you know, over 300 publications. He's spoken to over 300, uh, 1,300 um, events um, around the world. Uh, today, he will speak on the context and framework of international space law. Our third speaking, speaker is Dr. Gerardine Go Escalar. She is an adjunct associate professor and member of the law faculty here at the National University of Singapore. She has a, an extensive experience in international law practice, private and public. Um, she has held many international positions, including legal advisor to the president of the Iran U.S. Claims Tribunal. Uh, she's worked in the chambers of a judge of the ICJ. She's taught and researched at several European universities. She was a 2015 Brandon Fellow at the Lauterpock Center for International Law and has published extensively on space law. And in 2010 was awarded the Social Science Book Prize of the International Academy of Astronaut, uh, Astronautics. Excuse me, I may have mispronounced that. Um, Dr. Escalar's presentation will be on current trends in space 4.0 and their legal and regulatory implications. Last but certainly not least, Mr. Nicholas Hedman. He is from the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. He serves as secretary for the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space and its technical and scientific as well as legal um, uh, 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 subcommittee. He is also secretary of the UN Interagency Meeting on Outer Space Activities. Before he joined the UN, he was with the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where he represented them at various meetings concerning outer space, uh, including he was chair of the UNSPA CW3 plus five report and chief negotiator for Sweden for the US Swedish governmental <coughs> framework for space cooperation. In 2017, he received the Distinguished Service Award from the International Institute of Space and is currently vice chair of the COSPAR Planetary Protection Panel. He will be speaking to us on global governance of outer space activities. I now have the pleasure of inviting our first speaker, Stephen Freeland. Thank you so much, uh, Nilufa. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you, wherever you are. Um, I'm speaking to you from sunny Sydney. You can see the sun still shining on me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to the Centre for International Law, to the Singapore Attorney General Chambers, and for the um, Office of uh, Space Technology and Industry. Um, uh, our moderator and our guest uh, opening welcome speaker, Peter Ho, have set the scene well. Um, each of us have been given 
um, uh, 15 minutes to speak on topics that perhaps we could speak on for a lot longer. So please forgive me if um, it seems like I'm rushing over uh, important issues, but clearly in the Q&A we might be able to talk about that and there will be many, many other opportunities. So in um, as is usual, uh, please allow me to share my screen. Um, this is always the most scary part of uh, any presentation. The speaking is easy, it's the screen sharing that we don't worry about. Um, I've been asked to speak um, about the context and framework of international space law. Um, you had seen, you had heard already that um, our uh, Dr. Opal and Peter Ho had referred to the fact that there is a treaty regime. So I'll very quickly walk through that and walk through um, some other aspects to do with um, the way space is regulated at the international level. And that, of course, also has implications for national frameworks. And I know Singapore, along with many other countries, are carefully considering the appropriate national frameworks that they might have now and into the future. Um, but first we need to, uh, for those who may not be aware, understand what it is we're talking about. What is outer space? Um, it's really the first question that uh, is asked at any uh, Space Law 101 course. And one thing that we have to realize straight away is that um, in 1957, we had a seminal event that really started uh, intense debate, discussion, decision-making about the legal character characteristics of space. Um, that was the launch of Sputnik 1 by the Soviet Union on October 4th. Um, I was also born in 1957, I have to say, so I refer to myself as a Sputnik baby. Sputnik was the first human-made object that circumvented the Earth in Earth orbit, overflying a whole range of countries. Now, of course, from a legal perspective, the legal status of air law was very well understood. Airspace is part of the sovereign jurisdiction of the underlying state. But here you had an object in Earth orbit, overflying countries, but nobody claimed that this was part of their jurisdiction. Nobody claimed that the Soviet Union needed to get, seek their permission before this object was launched into, into Earth orbit and overflew their territory. And so very quickly, we understood that outer space is different from airspace. Airspace within national jurisdiction of the underlying state, outer space, an area beyond national jurisdiction. National law does not apply to outer space. It may apply to space objects and it may apply to personnel, but it doesn't apply to space per se. Akin perhaps to what you might also be familiar with the high seas. National law does not apply to the high seas. It will apply, for example, to Singapore flag vessels on the high seas. We have a a uh, slightly similar uh, registration system for space objects in space. And therefore, the regulation of space is done at the international level. And that's important to know. So a fundamental question that arises from that, and this was really debated from the very early times, even before Sputnik, there were debates about how far sovereignty extended above the earth. And some postulated that sovereignty went on forever. But all of a sudden, we realized that sovereignty in the, in the traditional sense did not apply in outer space because it, there was no jurisdiction there. And so it makes sense to understand where the delimitation is, where airspace ends. Singapore law applies to the airspace above it. Singapore law does not apply to the outer space above it. And so it would be very helpful, of course, to understand where that boundary is. And for a whole range of reasons that uh, we don't have time to go into, that question still remains unanswered. Essentially, it's a political issue as to whether we should have a delimitation or not. And indeed, if we were to where it was, but in international law, we still don't know. Although that hasn't stopped in any way, shape or form space activities from blossoming. So if you can take anything out of my section of this 
uh, wonderful panel. And I must say, it's such a pleasure to be speaking alongside three dear friends of mine who are just wonderful, esteemed experts, Nicholas, Sitsuko, and Jerry. Um, if you can take anything from what I say, it's this. Um, occasionally, one might hear uh, notions of space being the wild, wild west, or that anyone can get away with doing anything they want. That is not the case. There is a lot of law that applies. Law began almost immediately, as I demonstrated from my previous slide, with the launch of Sputnik. There was lots of discussion through the United Nations, which plays a central role in the development of the regulatory frameworks for space. Uh, many discussions, many UN Gen General Assembly resolutions in the 1960s, many decisions were made by the, the community of states about the important principles that would apply to space, and they are largely reflected in a series of treaties. Um, you heard mention made of the Outer Space Treaty, the first of those treaties, which really sets out absolutely fundamental principles that guide us all the way since 1967, continue to guide us now, will continue to guide us into the future. Then we have three other treaties that, if you like, add detail to the principles in the Outer Space Treaty. And then the last of these treaties, the Moon Agreement in 1979, dealt with the excitement at the time of uh, the possibility of exploiting the resources of the Moon. Of course, that's a very familiar discussion because that excitement has rekindled now in an even more enthusiastic way. But the Moon Agreement deals with that, that, that issue. However, at the geopolitical time that the Moon Agreement and indeed the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea were both being negotiated and dealt with mining resources, if, if you like to use that word, in these areas beyond jurisdiction, the Moon Agreement being the Moon and Celestial Bodies, UNCLOS being the deep seabed, that gave rise to some very significant geopolitical fissures. And indeed, the Moon Agreement was not very well subscribed to. Indeed, there are only 18 states parties. So as a result, there are no more treaties because of that experience. But that doesn't mean that the lawmaking and the framework constructions through the United Nations process have not continued. They've continued um, quite regularly. We have a whole range of General Assembly principles and guidelines and best practices that whilst they may not be traditional in the traditional sense of hard binding international law, they have legal value, they uh, reflect the need for responsible behaviour, and they are implemented and being implemented in national law. Of course, we also have the emergence of national law itself. As more and more countries get involved in space and more and more of their non-governmental entities within their jurisdiction get involved in space. So there is a lot of law. Into, there's more law in the sense that the Outer Space Treaty itself provides that activities carried out in space are to be carried out in accordance with international law for various purposes, as I've got on the slide. Now, that's very seductive. Some people say, aha, all international law applies to space. That is not the case. What this says is, activities in space must be carried out by applicable law, uh, by the international law that is applicable for the unique environment of space. And so there is more law that can be applicable, but it doesn't necessarily, you cannot copy paste laws, international laws that have been created for terrestrial purposes. You cannot just simply copy paste and say, aha, they now apply in space, given the unique characteristics from a political, a physical, a scientific, a legal a perspective that space is. That said, there are many other areas of international law that will be relevant. But as I've said, the, the really interesting and difficult question is to work out how they're relevant, how they might be adaptable to fill in and provide additional legal uh, coverage for the multitude of activities that take place in space. So space is highly legal. 
but it's many other things as well. It's intensely political, if I can use that term. Um, uh, the, the Sputnik mission took place in the geopolitical context of the Cold War. The antagonists in the Cold War were looking at space as another way of developing their capabilities. They were looking at space with military and strategic eyes. There was a need for organization from the UN to regulate that. We have the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space that looks at the P being peaceful you also have another body, UN body, the UN Conference of Disarmament, whose mandate deals with weapons, including weapons in space. So there was this bifurcation of mandates as to how space was uh, on an assumption which is no longer applicable that there's either, if you like, non-military activities or military activities in space. Space is now much more complex than that. Many of the assets in space operate in a dual use capacity that is, at the same time, they can uh, operate for civil and commercial purposes, but also have military customers. It's important to know also that space is commercial, some say democratized. If you fast forward to now, from the initial envisagement that space was just a state activity, there are many actors. And the global space economy is growing at 10%. The global space economy continues to grow even in the COVID times. And if you believe investment bankers, and I was an investment banker once before I became an academic, they are projecting the growth to very, very significant levels for the global space economy. Space is also many other things. There are many voices that we must look at when we look at space. And we must recognize that all of these voices are important because space is inextricably linked to our future in many ways. So I have two very short slides now about the challenges. I know Jerry in particular will go into more detail on some of these challenges, but there are challenges moving forward. Peter Ho mentioned that in his welcoming remarks, there are challenges for space law going forward. Challenges really driven by the rapid development of technology the rapid development of different types of activities. And so we need to work out frameworks that are not band-aid solutions, copy pasting from other lessons, but are truly adaptable to space. Some of the major challenges that we face and are listed here, most of them are newer types of activities that might be possible, that are possible, that are projected because of the development of technology Others are environmental questions and others deal with the, 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 the point that we must avoid military uses of space. And indeed also that last bullet point is not space directly, but we need to also incorporate an understanding of what might be known as high altitude because there are many pseudo satellites that now perform the functions that satellites cover and that also needs to be regulated. So my last slide is how do we move forward? We have wonderful principles through the treaties. They serve us really well. And they have essentially worked. Space has worked. But still, there's a lot of work that we need to continue because of the multitude of actors and activities. In doing that, for me, there are three overarching principles. One, notwithstanding test tensions, we must recognize that all space actors have a common interest to ensure that certain red lines are not crossed, that space remains sustainable, stable, secure, and safe, so that we can all utilize space for the future. That is industrialized countries and less industrialized countries. And as we move forward, as we develop additional frameworks, we must be cognizant of the humanity of space and our role as stewards of the planet, stewards of outer space, ensuring, and there are some major challenges ahead in the, in, the, in the guise of debris, ensuring that we avoid a tragedy of a commons of space, which would be irreversible given the unique physical and scientific characteristics of space and would be very much to the detriment of humanity as a whole and every country. So I apologize for rushing through 
thank you so much for listening. And I, like you, are very much looking forward to hearing my dear friends in their presentations. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll hand over to Nilufa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, and in fact, you were right on time. So no apologies at all. And can I say thank you for that fantastic overview where you brought us from Sputnik uh, and, and looking at the current state, but even more thoughtful questions for principles for the future. And I have to say someone who does ocean law, I was particularly taken by the idea of delimitation. We already have problems with maritime delimitation. I can't imagine space delimitation. But so thank you so much. And again, to the audience, I hope you will be patient. Uh, write your questions. We will take all your questions. But I think it's good to get the big overview from all our presenters before we take them up. So next, I have the great pleasure to introduce um, Mr. Nicholas Hedman, please. Thank you. It's a pleasure being invited. And I will now share my screen. So, uh, Stephen has already uh, given a quite an interesting overview of the development of international space law and also the role of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space in that regard. I will focus more on the governance perspectives of the intergovernmental work on the peaceful uses of outer space. So, as was said, uh, COPUS was established as a permanent body under the General Assembly in 1959, and I have a reference on this slide to the founding resolution. The mandates of the committee is quite general, and uh, there has over time, of course, been debates whether the mandate of the committee, as you can see in the first bullet there, are too general or whether that has actually served this intergovernmental political body to do business because as we know, if a mandate is too strict, it might constrain the uh, ev evolution of work. So if we look at the evolutionary history of uh, treaty making on the peaceful uses of outer space, the international legal regime on outer space activities, we will see that this particular intergovernmental body has created the space law framework comprising of five treaties, five sets of principles, and moreover, a few other instruments like resolutions, guidelines, best practices. Cupus has extended its membership from 18 in 1958, when it was only an ad hoc body, to 95 today in 2020. And as was said earlier, Singapore became a full member of the committee in 2019. Kubus also has a range of uh, permanent observer organizations, both intergovernmental and non-governmental. Among those, we can see the European Space Agency, for instance. The body works with two subcommittees, scientific and technical subcommittee and the legal subcommittee. If we look at the treaty status of, uh, of the five uh, United Nations Treaty on Outer Space, and I just repeat them, as we know, the Outer Space Treaty, the founding treaty with the principles laid down for space activities, the Magna Carta of space law often mentioned, the following treaties, Rescue Agreement, Liability Convention, Registration Convention, and the Moon Agreement lately in 1979. And I put on this slide, the current status as of 1st January 2020 for your information. What is interesting to note is uh, the governance phases of Corpus in terms of uh, treaty making and uh, law making, making of resolutions, guidelines, and other instruments. So from the 1960 to 1980, roughly, there was this 20-year period, the treaties were made, the five international, the five United Nations treaties on outer space. Then came a period also of 20 years from 1980 to 2000, and Stephen already mentioned this. That is the era of the so-called principles on outer space activities. Those uh, principles are non-legally binding instruments, so they are voluntary. 
Nevertheless, they are politically binding upon states because they have been adopted through General Assembly resolution. But it's very important to distinguish between the legally binding set of treaties and the non-legally binding set of principles. Then we followed a period of even less rulemaking within this intergovernmental body, roughly from 2000 to 2020, also a 20 year period, uh, where the body, uh, Cupus and its legal subcommittee and also the scientific and technical subcommittee predominantly looked into the application and implementation of rights and obligations under the treaties. So we were looking into resolutions ranging from the concept of the launching state, understanding what are the prerequisites for being a launching state, which is so fundamental in the legal regime of outer space. The best practices, or I would say enhancing the practices of registration among states and international intergovernmental organizations. National space legislation, we looked into what could be the elements for states in implementing their treaty obligations, and that also resulted in a resolution. We also had a working group chaired by Professor Setsuko Aoki, who is also a speaker in this panel, on international frameworks for space cooperation, looking into trilateral, bilateral frameworks that state as sovereign actors uh, embark upon between themselves, and also how states are forming their cooperation, international cooperation, via certain international intergovernmental organizations. And the latest uh, landmark here is the so-called guidelines for the long-term sustainability of outer space activities adopted by COPUS in 2019. So the question is now from 2020 and in the next 20 year phase, what will we see? There is no consensus among states members of the committee to uh, embark on further treaty making. There is no political consensus on the need of new treaties governing activities in outer space. So probably what we see from this slide here, the 20 year mark going from legally binding instruments, non-legally binding instruments, and further down resolutions and guidelines is probably something that will continue, but we don't know. The new era of planetary missions, uh, really exploration and innovation, resource management of, of celestial bodies might actually bring about a, a, a certain way of regulating activities. Uh, but uh, my tip is that a treaty making would be very difficult. If we look at governance regimes, uh, Stephen already talked about that. It's important to note that uh, outer space, including uh, the moon and other celestial bodies, is a very special regime, if I put it that way. But when we're looking into further uh, elaboration of regulatory needs or best practices, and also looking into how states implement their obligations under the treaties, and arriving at some sort of space traffic management systems, whether at the national level or in the future at the international level, it would be important to look into other governance regime. And there, of course, obviously, uh, in airspace, we have ICAO. This is particularly interesting from the perspective of suborbital flights and space tourism. Now, sea traffic, of course, we have to look into the uh, public international law regime on governing the oceans through the law of the sea convention, but more particularly, probably uh, also look into IMO, the private legal law, law system for maritime traffic to see how uh, certain measures, safety measures have been handled in that regard. Frequencies and the geostationary orbit are already being managed by the International Telecommunication Union and is very closely related to the activities in outer space also being laid down through the legal regime in outer space. 
And when we start looking at a regime or an international understanding and framework for uh, planetary activities, it would be important to look into uh, lessons learned, in particular from the deep seabed, uh, the International Seabed Authority Law of the Sea Convention, the whole regime of the area, meaning how we deal with resources and, and uh, in, um, uh, international relations being, being really targeting areas beyond national jurisdiction. Likewise, the Antarctic Treaty system would be uh, of some importance in that regard. And lastly, I would say cyber. I don't say that cyber is a governance regime, a full-fledged regime. Uh, it is a bit fragmented at the intergovernmental level, as we know, but cyber will come and become stronger and stronger in, in, in really uh, building up uh, a common understanding uh, in the future activities of outer space. So those are governance regimes that need to be looked into furthermore. So if we look at COPUS and its two subcommittees, uh, this is interesting. This is not uh, um, representing all the agenda items, but this is a snapshot of the range of topics, of issues, of concerns that this intergovernmental body is looking at. And as you can see, it ranges from technical scientific items to legal items and political items. The member states complement of COPUS is also quite engaging because now, as I said, we have 95 states members. Bangladesh has formally applied for membership in 22, so we will be 96 next year. And this is interesting from the perspective of broadness. The major spacefaring nations are members of the committee and we have a whole range of emerging space nations. So this variety of states, whether they are spacefaring or space using states is very important in order to really foster multilateralism at the intergovernmental global level. Very briefly, you and USA that I represent, we serve as the secretariat to this intergovernmental body, but we also have a dedicated program mainly for capacity building that we are conducting over the years. And we cover science, technology, law, and policy. And that is, in fact, quite interesting for an office of this nature. It's the only office uh, in the UN system uh, that is dealing solely with all aspects of space affairs for the peaceful uses of outer space. UNUSA is discharging the responsibilities of the Secretary General under space law. When we look into the treaties, when we look into some of the principles, we will find obligations vested with the Secretary General to disseminate information and uh, in, in various regards, and also that the United Nations under the Secretary General shall maintain the international register of objects launched into outer space, which is being handled by this office. If we now go to some a very interesting perspective of the International Register of Space Objects, and uh, considering that space activities are flourishing and they are changing, the landscape of space is changing, the uh, technological advancements are not the same as they were in 1958, 59, when this body was created, as we know. And the, the broadness of the space, um, space um, agenda has really uh, risen in, in recent years. And we see a large number of private and commercial actors in the space arena. What I want to illustrate by this slide is mainly that if you compare between the uh, space object that has been registered with this UN register, if you, if you compare between commercial and non-commercial, non-commercial being government uh, operated uh, space objects and commercial being uh, private, private operated space objects, we will see that only in the last year in 2020, we received more or less 1,000 registration submissions. Well, you see the blue uh, part of that, of that pillar not registered. It also means that we have received registration submissions, but they, the volume is so high that the system is, has a challenge in getting those registrations out. 
but there is an increase again in non-registration of, uh, of space objects, which is a worrying trend. But the most interesting factor here is the ratio between commercial private space objects being registered and non-commercial. And this table then speaks for itself. I will now deal a little bit with specifically with the long-term sustainability guidelines that I mentioned. Non-legally binding, voluntary under international law, those are best practices, those are guidelines, but they nevertheless apply to states and to international organizations and are aimed at guiding states in the way they are responsibly conducting space activities. The key features of the guidelines are uh, to a very, very certain extent of policy nature. There is a strong emphasis on national regulatory frameworks, the national supervision of space activities uh, being, being uh, carried out either by governmental agencies or non-governmental agent entities under the jurisdiction of the state. And obviously there, the component of enhancing registration practice. So this is a very strong feature in the guidelines. Space debris mitigation is per definition, one of the most important factors in dealing with the safety of space operations in orbit, as Stephen said. And there are detailed requirements in the guidelines on space objects and events to improve accuracy of orbital data, sharing space debris monitoring information, conjunction assessments. We are here absolutely moving into the field of space situational awareness. Space weather uh, is also part of this whole area of long-term sustainability and space situational awareness. Space weather data forecasts, this is something that we need more to have a more uh, open sharing of information among actors. If we look at the governance projection for the future, and remember I said the next 20 years, space traffic management is being discussed at the intergovernmental level, but space traffic management is not defined. It is not defined at the political level, meaning that we still don't really know what space traffic management will look like whether there is, will be a need for a top-down approach or whether there will be a bottom-up approach, meaning that space actors at the national level feed into the development of space traffic management. There are a few factors that would be important. Enhanced capacity building and awareness increasing, that is really one of the profound areas that we are looking at, both at the intergovernmental level and also from the Office for Outer Space Affairs. Increased dialogue with private sector, meaning that governments and their subjects under their jurisdiction being non-governmental entities really need to enhance a dialogue in order for the state to be able to form a robust uh, national regulatory framework for space activities. There is also a discussions on instituting organized reporting on the implementation of those long-term sustainability guidelines and obviously further development in that regard. And lastly, a structured information exchange at the COPUS level on space objects and events would be needed in order to sharing information and data and, and, and also lessons learned and best practices in avoiding collision, avoiding breakups, avoiding a, a growing population of space debris in orbit. And that would eventually lead to the fabrics of space traffic management. And lastly, if we look at space multilateralism, we need to understand that all the areas of space activities are cross-cutting, they are interlinked, but nevertheless, I believe that there is an importance to look into a structured approach, meaning that the space environment in terms of celestial bodies, the moon and other celestial bodies in the, in the solar system, including asteroids, need to be looked into separately from the orbits of space environment, where we will have more a, a, um, a unique 
uh, uh, I would say, a unique um, uh, element of space traffic management, because there we have the space debris dilemma, which is the overriding issue of concern for the safety of space operations in orbit, which is very different from the activities that we will have on celestial bodies, exploration, innovation, but also, as Stephen said, space resource utilization. And then lastly, the Earth environment with planetary defense, meaning near Earth objects, measures to, uh, to, um, to deal with a, a, a possibility of an impact from asteroids. Uh, also space weather, which is also applicable both to terrestrial, uh, <coughs> um, <coughs> to terrestrial functions and in orbit. And there we also have astronomical issues and concerns with dark and quiet skies. And this is an area which is coming strongly now from the astronomical community. There is a concern that the deployment of mega constellations will hinder the, necessi the necessity of really observing astronomically the, the sky. And everything has to come down to the establishment of an order an order of how we conduct inter international space activities, both through cooperation and coordination. And we have to look into the interest of various actors. There will be a conflict of interest. There is already a conflict of interest between governance interests, mainly from a geopolitical uh, standpoint and the presence of being on uh, landing, doing, uh, going with missions and landing on celestial bodies commercial interests of uh, planetary missions, in particular than uh, space resources, and scientific interest per definition of uh, really of uh, our activities on celestial bodies. And here we have uh, more specifically the planetary protection framework being managed by COSPAR. So interest of actors, meaning the uh, clash of interest between governance, commercial, scientific. That would be important whenever we continue dealing with governance and multilateralism at the intergovernmental level. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicholas, for that excellent and very clear um, explanation of the governance regime. And I have to say, what struck me is we went from the very structured period from 1960 to the 1980s to now soft law when perhaps we need more structure with all these activities and your graph of the registration was really striking. So I look forward to the discussion on this. All right, let me go on because I know time is going quickly. Next, it's my great delight to introduce uh, Professor Setsuka Aoki. The floor is yours. Thank you. Let me express my gratitude to well, for giving me this precious opportunity. I'm very, very thankful to you organizers and for the participants. The number is overwhelming 295. And the title is National and Regional Approaches to the Management. And oh, could you put my, <laughs> thank you. National and Regional Approaches to the Management and Regulation of Outer Space Activities. Next slide, please. My task is to survey national space registration and then address some regional approaches. As the time is limited, I will just refer to the regional space cooperation frameworks for the Southeast Asia for the presentation. Next one, please. Yes. For the purposes of this presentation, I refer to national space laws that are enacted specifically for authorizing and the continuing supervision of private space activities. And this slide shows the chronological development of international space law and the framework and the corresponding development of regional initiatives and national laws. Asian regional frameworks started after 1990s. For instance, Asia Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum, APRSA from 1993, and the first Asian International Intergovernmental Organization, Asia Pacific Space Cooperation Organization, APSCO, Substantially started in 2008, and the APSCO Convention itself was entered into force in 2006. Around the end of the second decade of the 21st century, then Africa and Latin America established regional organizations, Africa in 2018 and Latin America in 2020. Next one, please. Thank you. 
The National Space Rules are enacted for various reasons. Number one is for discharging international responsibility under Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty. But in addition to that, to protect nationals from a highly risky activity, preparation on the compensation for the innocent victims. That is perhaps the second most important reason. And third, industrial po industry policy. To nurture space commercialization and privatization, states tend to make a risk allocation between the launch provider and the government. And as time passes, the scope of the activity covered by national space law is enlarging. This slide shows it, but with using the next four slides, four charts, I will explain it more deeply. The next slide, please. Yes. This slide shows the National Space Act enacted in the 20th century. And uh, the year is the first, the year is the year, its law, the first law was made. And as far as I know, eight states made National Space Activities Act. All laws have the authorization schemes for launch. If states don't have its own launch vehicles, licensing schemes were provided for the procuring launch or the launch site operation and the foreign launch, foreign rocket launch. In case of the UK, for instance, procuring launch for its nationals were provided for in the 1986 Act. Then UK recently made the Space Industry Act where its own rocket launching is planned. How to make authorization schemes depends on the situation and national policy. In some cases, space activities are defined very broadly and all or some of them are under the authorization scheme. Russia and the Ukrainian laws, for instance, define space activities broadly and only part of them needs authorization. The next slide, please. In the first decade of the 21st century, seven states made a national space act and I added Brazil and China. Also, the, their regulations are not full-fledged law, but contents are authorization and su supervision of private space activities. Canada and Germany made specifically for the operation and data provision of remote sensing satellites. Standalone remote sensing acts are made by a small number of states, the US, Canada, Germany, and Japan. The purposes of remote sensing acts are different from other space activity acts. It's to make a fine balance between national and international security and the promotion of remote sensing data business. So remote sensing acts well, are not directly from the obligation of Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty. South Korea is the first Asian country which enacted National Space Act in 2005. And two years later, South Korea enacted Liability Act focusing on the third party liability. Next slide, please. In the second decade of the 21st century, see further increased number of states make national laws. Then in this decade, in addition to the traditional space activities, site operation is also a target of the licensing. This shows the increasing privatization and the commercialization of space activities. In 2020, after the US, China, Russia, and the European Space Agency, New Zealand is the fifth in the world for the number of the satellites launched from its territory. This is a result of a new space company launching satellites from its own launch site in New Zealand. Also, there is a tendency that national acts provide for debris mitigation measures and registration of space objects in response to the developing UN instruments in this regard. Following the 2015 US law, Luxembourg made a national law focusing only on the authorization schemes of space resources exploration. Next slide, please. So 11 more, 11 more states have enacted National Space Activities Act in the second decade of the 21st century. UAE, it's, it's uh, well, interesting includes in its space activities, space resources mining and the human space flight that are under the authorization scheme. Next one, please. So authorization schemes are grouped into two, launch and operation of satellites. So just very briefly, let me explain it. Well, so 
for the launch of launch vehicle, this is an elaborate review of systems of safe rocket, safe launching site, and safe flight paths, and the third party liability, TPL plans to compensate for the innocent victims should an accident occur. For promotion of the launch industry, in many cases, there is an allocation of the risk between the government and launch providers. Sometimes channeling of liability is provided for. As of today, France and Japan explicitly provide the channeling of liability to the launch providers, even if an accident occurs because of the satellite side. Next one, please. So this is a TPL chart, and I wouldn't go into explanation of this chart. This is a Japanese government indemnification system. And I want to say, all one I want to say is a launch provider, after all, has to pay for the yellow part, TPL insurance. And the list is paid by the government, as long as uh, the the, gov the company buys an insurance and abide by Japanese Space Activities Act. Next slide, please. Then for the operation of satellite, now, licensing schemes for satellite operation usually don't require TPL insurance due mainly to the low possibility of the damage to the third party. Currently, as far as I know, only the United Kingdom Act requires satellite operator to buy on orbit TPL insurance. Responding to the UNG resolutions in the 21st century, now space debris mitigation and registration are in the licensing schemes. And well, even a state doesn't have its launch vehicle, its national law may include launch licensing systems envisioning the private rocket and private space boats and private space tourism. Next one, please. Yes, so from here, regional approaches in Southeast Asia. Now, this is a part of Thailand submitting paper to the legal subcommittee of the COPIOS on international mechanisms for cooperation in the peaceful exploration and use of outer space in 2017. Thailand reported that for Thailand, the most important forum for cooperation is ASEAN. Next slide, please. And this is 2019 Philippine Space Act. And uh, this act provides that, well, as shown on the slide, uh, for saving time, I wouldn't read it. And uh, not directly mentioned that ASEAN is a cooperative forum, but the key players in the ASEAN and the space capabilities sought advancing hand in hand. Next slide, please. Yes, this is AFSCO. And APSCO is the first Asian intergovernmental space organization. And curiously, membership is substantially not limited to Asian countries. APSCO as a linchpin, its relationship is further enlarging with various frameworks, including the United Nations Regional Center for Space Science and Technology Education for the Asia Pacific, and also One Belt, One Road mechanisms. I, also want to add that UN Regional Centers for Space Science and Technology is, well, in Asia, also situated in New Delhi, India, and Jordan. Next and the last slide, please. Yes, thank you. Finally, let me tell you that now APRSAF has National Space Registration Initiative Working Group, and currently, voluntarily participating members are making a status report of National Space Registration of each state to submit to that, well, to this year's legal subcommittee. Space agencies and the government, governmental science and technology agencies of Australia, India, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam are members. This is one of the regional space law cooperation and I'm participating in this and find that exchanging views on the regulatory mechanisms of each other is certainly a valuable experience for understanding each other and jointly fostering the rule-based space exploration and use for the long sustainability of our common province. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Sasuka. You provided us the perfect transition from the international global to the national and regional um, legal frameworks. And I was really struck by your table and just seeing how much difference there were and what the different legislations covered for space law. 
um, but it also I'll be following uh, the developments in Asia. So thank you so much. Last but certainly not least at all, uh, it's my pleasure to have uh, Dr. Geraldine Go Escolar uh, give us her presentation, please. Thank you very much, Nilofer. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day uh, to all of you joining us. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation. As a proud daughter of Singapore, I am absolutely thrilled at the amount of interest uh, Singapore now has, especially in space exploration, use industry, and of course, space law. Uh, I'll share my screen with you now. Hopefully that works. Um, because I share Stephen's fear, there it is. Um, today I'll speak to you about current trends in space 4.0 um, and their legal and regulatory implications. And the reason why I'd like to call, call this space 4.0 is there was a lovely article by Brian Israel just a while ago that talks about space 1.0 focusing on international relations, space 2.0 focusing on the national uh, shift in, in how the national legislations work, space 3.0, which focuses on effective business um, implications and activities in space, and now space 4.0, I would like to say, which focuses on the greater good uh, for humanity. We see that also in practically every other business uh, industry in the world today, uh, an interest in making sure there's a social impact, uh, that business is sustainable, um, and going forward that we take care not just of what's happening today, but of our future and our children's future. So if I may, uh, today the outline, uh, I have the challenge of speaking about uh, the macro trends in industry, space, law, uh, legal and regulatory initiatives in 15 minutes. I'm going to do my best. It's a, it's a bit of a challenge, uh, but we'll talk about then the macro trends in industry. Uh, then I'd like to move on to the recent developments in the legal and regulatory landscape and then talk about each specific recent domain developments. I won't be able to go into detail because of time considerations, but I understand that this slide deck will be circulated. And of course, I'm always open if anyone would like to, to ping me directly uh, for a, a conversation over coffee. So let's move on quickly to the macro trends in industry. Um, and there, the first macro trend that we're seeing is the transsectoral capacities of the space industry. It involves interdisciplinary technology, which run, runs the entire gamut from digital tech and engineering to artificial intelligence to advanced manufacturing, cybersecurity, and especially interoperability. What does that mean? A bunch of very intelligent, very interested people of completely different fields are coming together to focus on what we call cross-cutting services. That has an impact on multiple downstream industries, national security, disaster risk management, remote industries, and environmental. Now, what does that then lead to? It leads up to various different spin-offs uh, for the different industries on Earth. And there, of course, what we see are different um, offshoots that come from these transsectoral capacities of space technology in the energy sector and infrastructure when it comes to building big structures in agriculture, manufacturing, marine, defense and security, and location-based services. This past year, given the effect of the pandemic uh, of uh, COVID-19 as well, we've seen many space industries now also helping in the fight against COVID-19. We see uh, PPE production from Airbus, ULA, and Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit that actually put uh, satellites in orbit off the back of a Boeing 747 last week also built ventilators in the last year. So we see a lot of these spin-offs and the transsectoral capacities of space technology and the space industry. And that leads us to macro trend number two, the changes in business models as we're moving forward. We see, uh, you've already heard the mention actually uh, of uh, startups uh, and versus the establishment. We see a lot of new startups with their feet in the door uh, getting government contracts. Uh, the most uh, famous one, of course, at the moment, SpaceX um, and going towards uh, the moon and Mars, perhaps. We're seeing different kinds of innovation models. They're sustaining innovation, basically building what we have better, quicker, faster cheaper and there's disruptive innovation building what we have differently completely differently uh, getting to the places that we want to get to now what does that mean it leads to a lot of restructuring and over the last couple of years we've seen quite a lot of vertical integration in the space industries uh, we've seen basically um, 
a lot of acquisitions. So it's the most famous ones. Raytheon acquired Blue Canyon. Rocket Lab acquired Sinclair. Uh, there are also mergers. So Telesat and Laurel Space combined. Uh, we also have, of course, seen uh, some bankruptcies. One Web, which was then rescued by the US, uh, UK government, excuse me, um, in, a, in a restructured format, Intelsat. Um, but we also now see a lot of um, outsourcing because there's bespoke service delivery, reliance on commercial off-the-shelf technology and the internationalizations of both supply and value chains. Interestingly, space has always been seen as a halo sector. It's a, uh, it's a sector that brings the greatest benefits, a lot of benefits to uh, industry, to the people on the street. But space is also becoming very mainstream. Every one of us touches space today when we hold up our mobile phones, when we stream uh, our entertainment uh, channels, and when we read the news online. Everything is now an industry that touches space. The prediction actually is that by 2035, there will be no business on Earth that does not touch a space capacity. Whether it streams live from a direct broadcasting satellite, whether it has a telecommunications uh, a part of it, every business by 2035 is expected to at least touch one part of the space industry. And that leads to mindshare growth. Instead of upstream driver tech that pushed the market forward, we're now actually seeing downstream market demand pull. And that's the macro trend number two. Quickly then, macro thread number three, and this we see, as I said, across a whole bunch of different sectors, the awareness of environmental, social and governance issues, growing awareness in industry, most importantly for public health and safety. You've heard uh, Nicholas and his wonderful slide with all the different range of items that we see on Copuos's agenda. Uh, you see, of course, it touching climate change in the environment with advanced SAT-based uh, applications. We see green industry and sustainability, and that's not just on planet, so protection of our planet, the Earth, but also in space sustainability on orbit, in particular with regard to orbital debris. We're now talking about ethical use. Um, the benefit of all humanity, the concept of wind driven, basically, the, you know, this this idea that it moves together with where the ethics goes. And of course, we have space diplomacy, the idea of using space as a tool uh, for international cooperation and greater engagement across um, countries and continents. What's important is that each macro trend has a domino effect, meaning that one change in a trend then changes the rest of the other trends and the rest of the industry. So if I may, I'd like to move on to the developments in the legal and regulatory landscape. Um, and, and I think the, the two words that I'd like you to take perhaps away from, from this is strategic alignment is what they call it in Oxford. Um, you've heard Mr. Peter Ho speak about the tandem development of technology, business and the law. Uh, and in particular, Stephen, he, he has just said, space is not the wild, wild west. It really isn't. Uh, there's already a framework of law, there's a framework of regulation, and everything actually happens within that ecosystem. Of course, that ecosystem evolves. And this is what we're speaking of today. There is, of course, the uh, regulation to either facilitate or to obstruct. Now, both things could work. It really depends on how um, the, the regulatory body would like to, to do that. No, most importantly, we're looking at the changing face of globalization. And what does that mean? It means there's greater democratization across sectors, but it also means that alliances are shifting and the sands of international cooperation is also shifting. Therefore, regulation could be used as circuit breakers, um, not in the way we use it in Singapore for the COVID uh, measures, but really as, as a way of stopping something. Uh, one of the um, recent reports from MIT Tech Review refers to the decision from Russia that it'd like to unplug from the global internet. Now, to do that, you would need your own system of internet. And one of the ways to do that across a vast territory is through satellite broadcasting. Um, of course, we also see the rise of what I call Space Agency Incorporated. Um, and there are fantastic uh, two examples from the Australian Space Agency and from the United Arab Emirates' Comprehensive Space Strategy. The idea is to uplift national capacity and capability and therefore increase re uh, resistance and uh, resilience, excuse me, in the industry, the workforce and the skills to identify and engage with uh, opportunities with investors and to reinforce the role of regular regulation and governance as a partner, as a facilitator and as a regulator, as well as as a customer. 
you see, of course, the uh, evolving shape of multilateralism. Uh, Nicholas has spoken in very good detail about the IGOs and uh, the United Nations and how they remain relevant. Um, we see, of course, as well, a lot of multilateralism through bilateralism today. A uh, great example, the Artemis Accords, uh, which are se a series of bilateral agreements, but which actually are a multilateral framework to get to the gateway to Moon and to Mars, similar a bit to what we see at the very beginning for the International Space Station, which is humanity's greatest project in international cooperation. Today, we also see overlapping alliances, and the wonderful example there is that of Europe, a uh, signatory and a partner of the Artemis Accords and the Artemis Program. Uh, and just very recently, in the beginning of this year as well, um, working with China on quantum key distribution and quantum communications. Interestingly, we're seeing also a lot of regulatory differentiation. Um, and there are we like, of course, less regulatory surprises in the industry, but continue innovation to accommodate the growth in the industry, the different and divergent approaches which have been taken. Um, and some, of course, the, some of the regulations require uh, regulating for international obligations. Now, states actually want to fulfill their international obligations. You know, most countries don't sign up the treaties just to break them. Nobody wants to do that. They would like to actually meet their international obligations. So a lot of these countries are now coming up with space law legislations in their domestic framework that allow them to meet those obligations. Um, of course, we also regulate now for social license and sustainability, including safety regulations and standards, and as well um, for technology transfer and as an investment attractiveness lever as an investment policy, which have both traditional and more innovative means. Traditionally, of course, there are tax cuts, there are incentives to invest, especially for foreign investors uh, in a particular sector. More innovatively, there are ideas on how to grow the space industry in a particular uh, environment, in a particular national ecosystem. So in the very short time remaining to me, I'd like to just touch on certain recent domain developments. Uh, and there, I like to just group them in three categories, satellites, access, and industry. And in satellites, we see four big um, categories. That's digital technology, earth observation, communications, and navigations, and location-based services. On digital technology, that's what's, what's special about this particular subsector is that it's a combination of multiple digital technologies. There's DLT or blockchain, there's additive manufacturing, machine learning and AI, and of course, the cloud. Lots of advantages that you see there on the slides, but I'd like to focus on the regulatory challenges. One big challenge is cohesive regulation because this is so cross-border in so many ways, uh, it defies the regular method of regulatory, um, regulatory initiatives, which usually look at certain borders. Now, the internet has no borders, space also has no borders, but they're different kind of non-borders. We also want to make sure that the regulatory um, framework does not create barriers to entry and it allows itself to adapt to the rapid tech and business developments uh, in the field. We need to talk, of course, about cross-border conflict of laws and security and privacy issue. And an example there is the EU's digital strategy. Earth observations, which I won't go much into because you've heard uh, Setsuko, a uh, very good uh, explanation of what's happening in Canada and Germany. Uh, of course, high resolution, high temporal revisit with lots of advantages, especially to climate change and environmental monitoring and disaster management. But of course, also some regulatory challenges in regard of national security, privacy, big data and intellectual property. Satellite telecommunications uh, and ICT enab enable global economy as what we're moving towards. It is the largest sector of satellite applications. There is great demand for higher capacity, higher security, assurance. Um, of course, we want greater connectivity. We've seen how important that is in the last year. Now, the regulatory challenges that we're facing is developments in the non-traditional spectrum. So aside from the regular spectrum that the ITU is already regulating, they're now outside of that, we're looking at different spectrums. We're looking at uh, security and assurance issues, public services, and new technologies such as quantum communications. ITUs, of course, on it, and the EU as well is starting to look further into the digital strategy for satellite comms. 
Navigation, it's a four dimension pinpoint accuracy on the Earth's surface. That's uh, length, width, height, as well as time. There's mass market devices of uh, LBS cap cap capability, including road geometry and intelligent transport systems, in particular for autonomous and uncrewed vehicles. Lots of challenges there, security as usual, privacy, a question of third party liability. And there, of course, Setsuko has gone into very good detail about that. Uh, we have lots of regulations there um, from China, of course, related relating to its own uh, navigation and LBS system, uh, as well as the European Union, which is GNSS regulations. Now, in relation to access, that's what we're all excited about, launch space situational awareness and space traffic management. Now, the launch market trends are seeing lots of reduction of cost of access to space. If the predictions for SpaceX is correct, we're going to see a reduction of launch from 26,500 per kilogram on the space shuttle to just under $2,000 per kilogram on SpaceX. That's enormous. What does that mean? It also changes the engineering of these projects because if launch is cheaper, it's easier not to over-engineer for safety and for resilience. We're seeing a lot of spaceport developments. Um, just this week, it was reported SpaceX has bought two oil rigs off of Texas, in addition to its Boca Chica range, which is undergoing environmental impact assessments as well. We're seeing lots of technological trends with new generations of systems and launches and the development of engines for low cost propellants and governance trends. As you see, a shift in governance and risk from public to private, proliferation of um, spaceports and launches, increasing need for space traffic governance. Talking about space traffic governance and management, there are lots of different things we need to look at. Environmental impact assessments, uh, a comprehensive and international space traffic management, situational awareness to avoid conjunctions, as well as commercial and civil society initiatives. Now, interestingly, the space traffic management issues have actually caused a huge change in the space insurance industry. It used to be just really about third party li liability insurance, and now it's a much more umbrella approach. Now, just the last thing is really to do with industry, that's assets, manufacturing, resources, and extractive industries, and crude and robotic exploration. Now, in relation to assets, uh, the military aspect of this will never really go away. Uh, space assets play a huge role in military activities. It is also a sovereignty demonstration role. And of course, now you see a increasing number of um, organizations dealing with military assets in outer space. In terms of the manufacturing and extractive industries, you see in-space manufacturing, and there we need to talk about IP and liability issues, as well as the common benefit of all mankind. Space resource utilization, and there you see as well the different regulatory challenges, including procedures for priority rights, uh, safe zones, and technology readiness levels, as well as environmental safety. Robotic missions uh, and uh, human exploration, including space tourism, moon programs, transportation, and robots. Lots of different things there, but I'd like to point out to what Nicholas actually uh, referred to, which is the planetary protection uh, principles that are being run by COSPAR. We want to make sure there's no harmful interference and contamination. Uh, we also look at the registration of space objects, a huge amount of it, because registration in the Outer Space Treaty is linked directly to jurisdiction and control. We need to talk about on-orbit transfer of control and ownership and what happens in the cases of responsibility and liability, as well as in emergencies. So I'd like to stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'll give it right back to Nilufa. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jerry Dean. That was absolutely brilliant presentation. And in the interest of time, I will just stop here only to say that I feel we've scratched the surface of such a, um, a deep and complex area of law at international and national and regional levels. Um, so we could go on and I think we will hopefully follow up uh, with more um, webinars uh, on this. But we have many, many questions. And so to all our audience, thank you for your patience. Uh, clearly there's a high level of interest. And I'm happy to say that our panelists have agreed to stay on another 15 minutes to at least answer some of the questions. There's so many of them. And I think that's my big challenge. <laughs> some of these questions read like uh, exam questions, frankly, <laughs> they're quite long. Um, so I'm gonna start with those that, um, I, I see we have some that have been voted on. Uh, so let me take one. I can't answer, ask all of it, Mohammed um, Haq. Um, 
But there was one question uh, that had to do with the, the different domestic laws and whether we need to develop a strong international mechanism in order to ensure that all domestic laws concerning space conform to international legal standards and policy. Um, and let me just go on. There's also another question that's related to Mohammed's second question, and that's from Nur Hafsa Kamardin concerning um, the Article 4 um, of the OS Treaty. Um, and it's the question about the peaceful use and questions about um, military uh, activities. And so, um, again, I have to summarize this. We just don't have time. Um, so the question is whether all three elements of establishing military bases, installations and fortifications, the testing of weapons, the conduct of military maneuvers, um, if you it involve uh, to make it as an offense, if yes, does it mean the establishment of military alone is allowed, but not for peaceful purposes? So I go goes to the issue of the militarization, perhaps. Um, one is, I think, an easy one. If we're interested in learning more about space law, what are the avenues? Um, so let me just stop here and open the floor to the panelists. Um, and we can just do a round of table and pick your question to answer. And if there's something you saw yourself uh, in this long list, please feel free to answer those questions. So I open the floor to our panelists um, to answer the questions I pose or if they have another one they would like to answer. Who would like to go first? <laughs> Do we need standardization, international mechanism? What about the whole question of militarization? Okay, Nicholas. Yeah, um, thank, am I, I'm not muted, no? Okay, yes, I, I'm looking at the, the, uh, the question from Mohammed, I think you read out, the, the, the question whether there is a need for, I would say, harmonization of, of national regulatory frameworks and, and create a framework so that states really would abide by the rights and obligations under the treaties. It's very, this is a long standing question, has been out there for 15, 20 years. We have been discussing how, how would state go about in harmonizing certain aspects in their national regulatory regimes. What is important to note is it it's, it's the prerogative of a sovereign nation to implement its obligations and right under the treaty for which they are state parties. So no one else can tell a state how to regulate its national activities. And so that is crystal clear. It's very difficult to, to, uh, to um, uh, create a, a, an overarching international framework which was would demand states to implement their obligation in a certain way. But definitely sharing of information, sharing of, uh, of, of space law uh, texts, you know, we have that in the office of website, USA website. We are trying, you know, to build up an awareness of how states implement their obligations. But it's very difficult to force states to implement in a certain way. Thank you. Yes, Stephen? Thank you. Um, and I agree with Nicholas. Let me just. Um, add one or two more things. Um, uh, if we stopped now and gave everybody a blank piece of paper and said, okay, based on what you know about the international treaty framework and the obligations that Nicholas raised um, and, and uh, all of our speakers spoke about, what is it that you would have to put in your national law? So there are certain obligations that directly flow from being a party to the Outer Space Treaty, and virtually every spacefaring nation is a party to the Outer Space Treaty, that require you, when you develop your national law to regulate non-state actors that are within your jurisdiction, you have to include an authorization regime, uh, stuff about avoiding nuclear weapons, for example, and a whole range of things. So to a certain degree, there's a standardization in terms of the headings, as Nicholas said, states might wish to implement them in different ways. The other aspect of that is, and uh, I've been very lucky, I've worked with a lot of governments to help them with their national laws. You walk in there and you ask them all the same questions at the beginning. You know, what do you need? What, you know, what is it that, that you're looking for? The answers to those questions will be different for every country because besides, in, uh, apart from the implementation side of the obligations, Countries have national space law to 
for a whole variety of purposes to promote their industry, to uh, represent themselves as good stewards to the board, and, and to protect themselves from liability issues or whatever. There are so many factors and every country is different. Singapore, when it contemplates drafting its own national law, will look at the same questions but come up with different uh, answers because they will have to provide for legislation that best meets its own interests. So you will have a harmonization to a certain degree on some of the topics, but you won't have a harmonization in terms of the standards, the requirements, the balance that a national uh, framework makes in terms of, on the one hand, protecting the state from liability and etc., and on the other hand, encouraging entrepreneurship in the sense that Jerry was talking about with all these things. Just on the military issues, um, I saw the question, uh, the moon and other celestial bodies are to be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. Um, the, the, uh, the sentences that follow are various examples of what is uh, permitted and what is not permitted. But, but um, it's absolutely clear, and you'll see in the Moon Agreement, in the Artemis Accords, in all of the discussions that deal with the way we look at uh, celestial bodies that everybody is concerned to avoid as much as possible any semblance of conflict, because we all understand that on Earth, many conflicts have developed out of a, a rush for resources, and clearly that's something we have to avoid in space. I'll stop there because I'm sure my other colleagues have other things to say, but uh, there's there's much more that can be said. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so, Geraldine? Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, please. Yeah, no, no. Uh, please go ahead, Geraldine. Well, thank you, Satsuko. I apologize. Um, just a little thing perhaps to add. It's always it's a hazard to be on a panel with uh, with Nicholas, uh, Stephen and Satsuko because it's so hard to add to the things that they already know and say. Um, but I, I think one of the things which uh, has always struck me in relation to harmonization is that the UN Treaty Framework almost provides, as you will, an international minimum standard. Uh, because as Stephen says, a lot of countries would like to avoid liability, avoid international responsibility for wrongful acts. Uh, they would like to meet their treaty obligations. That's basically the baseline. But beyond that, what kind of space laws we'd like to have, as Stephen says, really depends on the context and who's creating those space laws and for what in their own national context. Uh, and, and there we're starting to see also a, a lot of thought leadership. Uh, we've seen it first in the environmental law field uh, where you know I'm mean, trying to protect the environment at the very beginning wasn't good business. But as we started to think about it in terms of sustainability, space sustainability in and of itself is almost a self-enforcing mechanism. You want to ensure that you can continue using it. You also want to be ensure that you are being seen as a thought leader, um, not just for liability issues, but going forward, that your industry takes into all this into account, that your regulatory framework is in compliance, that you go beyond that, actually. Uh, we're starting to see the movement there in terms of entrepreneurship and industry. So that's at least a feeling that I got. Um, I can only agree with what Stephen said in relation to Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty. Um, and there, of course, uh, what he very correctly said in his presentation, that also all international laws apply. Uh, therefore, the United Nations Charter also does, and the questions of peaceful users always come around the same topic. Um, I'm going to then cede it to Sitsiko, who I'm sure has quite a lot to say on, on the topic. Uh, and Nilafer, if you'd like, I will then um, talk about the question of learning about space law. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, so about the militarization, well, I don't have anything to add. And uh, but for well, harmonization, well, it's not. Well, I agree with uh, well, three of you. But for for instance, but lessons learned and the soft kind of invitation can be done by the United Nations. And uh, actually now, well, our team APR staff. National Legislation Initiative. We exchange views and making status report using the 2013 National Legislation Principles resolutions. So it has eight items, eight recommendations, and in accordance with that, we make reports. And it's already, it's not a harmonization, but that will make a base for the future harmonization and a lot of amicable atmosphere is given if we base United Nations shared values. 
So that is the role of the United Nations, I think. And about some, well, praise for <laughs> learning space law. There are many, well, universities and uh, space law centers, but to go there is difficult. But now, well, for instance, webinars and also home pages of universities, many universities, and the first thing to learn space law for the good source is UN USA's website. I regularly check registration pages and always run something. Never, well, it's never stop, it's never be boring. So, yeah, so you and USA site and other places. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Jardine, uh, uh, anyone else want to add on the learning? Because there, there's about seven votes for that. So it seemed that um, there's an interest in that. Um, Jardine, did you want to say something? Yes, sorry. Um, thank you. Um, on, on learning space law, firstly, thank you for actually wanting to learn about space law. I think that's <laughs> tremendous and is really important. Uh, obviously, the panelists today um, have, have quite a lot of information out there already. Uh, Stephen, in particular, has uh, quite a lot of online information as well. I do believe a lot of his articles are online in his webinar, so I, I see his, his face very often virtually, if not in real life. Um, as Satsuko says, the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs is a fantastic resource. I found the United Nations Audiovisual Library also to be very important, especially hearing from the greats uh, of space law, Judge Veris Chetin, for example. I mean, it's quite amazing to see these big names uh, talk uh, about space law. Uh, obviously, there are a couple of, of uh, space law textbooks that one could look at. They usually focus on a public international law point of view, so really the treaty frameworks and then each domain. Um, but uh, there are also space law courses uh, across the world, uh, including at Singapore, uh, in Australia, um, you know, across Europe and North America and South America uh, that uh, you could sign up for. I know you can audit those courses as well. So there are lots and lots of things. Um, I just wanted to also say, by all means, write uh, any of us, I do believe I'm putting my panelists in front of the bus here. But uh, I think we would also be happy to provide uh, you know, with information if you are uh, interested in that. Thank you, Nilofa. Thank you. I'm going to go on to some more questions since we have a little bit more time. Here is one from Noodle Amy that has nine uh, thumbs up. And it is about uh, in 2016, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs and the Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz International Prize for Water signed an agreement to collaborate uh, for their common goal of promoting the use of space-based technology for increased access to water. Can, can you elaborate more on this? Is there anyone who's able to uh, answer that question? Nicholas? Okay. Yeah, thank you. I, I saw that question. And uh, yes, absolutely. The PSIPW uh, is a permanent uh, observer organization to COPUS. And uh, since some years, we have been working with this organization, which is based in Saudi Arabia, in promoting water management. And uh, basically what this organization does, I mean, they have, they have a lot of activities in really promoting the use of space technology and water management, but they also have an annual um, uh, contest uh, and, and they issue actually an award, really a prestigious award in research on technical and scientific research in, in water management, predominantly by using space technology. And uh, we are teaming up with this organization and really in fostering the, this important field of, of, uh, of, of space concern. And I mean, not only, but using space technology for a concern that uh, actually is, is relevant for all of us. Uh, if you look at the website of the Office for Outer Space Affairs, there is a, a portal, a portal we have launched there uh, that deals with water management and also obviously from the space uh, technology perspective, space applications. So uh, visit the website and you will find information on the, this joint effort by PSIPW and the office. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, I can go on to another question. Um, this is from Andy Kia. Uh, Regarding in-orbit TPL, what is the current thinking on in-orbit collision? Is there a current framework in assessing liabilities in the event of accidental, non-intentional accidents? So I open the floor. Um, Stephen, sure. 
Thank you. I'm, I'm sure this is a question that uh, any one of us um, would be happy to answer. Um, one of the treaties that Nicholas and I refer to is uh, a liability framework. Uh, the liability framework has a number of regimes, uh, one involving uh, damage caused by space objects coming down to Earth or hitting aircraft, but the other one uh, involves collisions between space objects in space. And the regime there is determined not by intention, not by malice, not by being deliberate, but the regime is a fault-based regime. And so um, if there are collisions, then um, there is a dispute resolution mechanism there or discussions if it were to get to it, that dispute, uh, a determination of fault. That is a lot harder than it sounds because of the complexities of everything that's going on. And I won't go into that now. But the question also raises this notion, we're now talking about um, uh, new types of technology, for example, in orbit servicing of, of satellites, which um, is a, a wonderful technique if it works because it will extend the life of satellites, it'll lower the need, it'll ho hopefully mitigate de debris. But every new um, activity that we engage in, of course, things go wrong, they have their hazards, the technology may not work immediately, uh, there are always going to be accidents and of course the liability regime is there and will apply and it gives rise to the question about in the future uh, in my second last slide I talked about the challenges for space law and challenges for space law are very much driven by all of the technology that's giving rise to these wonderful activities but the framework we have as good as it is perhaps may not be absolutely suitable for some of the new types of technologies we might need to take things into account um, down the track and so um, the question raises this idea that we've got to continually think um, about issues like liability but at the moment the liability regime is pretty clear about in orbit collisions thank you Great. thank you yeah thank you for that um satsuka you wanted to say something as well yes uh, thank you and uh, well, for as far as the liability convention is concerned, it's uh, between launching states and launching state. Of course, while well, private uh, plane, it's different. So to find a procuring launching state is more and more difficult. And if some in orbit device well is launched or uh, deployed from a kind of space station owned by a private person, and uh, that space station is not registered then on the well private international law perspective it would be difficult so the next decade would be very interesting for young people who run space law so please yeah. do study space law <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Good. yeah absolutely this promotes space law <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i have one question here and perhaps this is for Jaradine uh, from noor hafiza kamardin does singapore have any national space law regulations uh, which regulates space activities in Singapore, like other jurisdictions, just meaning what laws, I think basically, do we have laws on space law in Singapore? Uh, thanks, Nilofa, and thank you for the question. I think Singapore has approximately 13 or so satellites in orbit. It does not have a comprehensive national space legislation at the moment or a national space agency, uh, aside from the Office of Space Technology and Industry at the EDB. Uh, but there is, that doesn't mean that there's no regulation. Uh, regulation of Singapore's steadily growing industry lies in various different pieces of domestic legislation. Uh, I'll give you an example, the Telecommunications Act, I think chapter 323. Um, as well as, uh, for example, spacecraft and spacecraft parts, which are subject to export and transport or shipment control under, under the uh, Strategic Goods Control Act of 2019. Uh, there's, of course, also insurance requ requirements for non-citizen, non-national entities, which require approval from the Monetary Authority of Singapore in relation to insurance for orbital launches. Um, but no, the, the answer to that, the simple answer is there is no comprehensive space legislation, but that doesn't mean that there's no regulation per se. Austin, I'm sure of the EDP, it serves as the natural bureau to foster growth of competitive space industry. Um, and um, I think as of last year, the Business Times reported, or rather 2019, the Business Times reported that Singapore has approximately 30 commercial companies in the space industry. Uh, that does mean that we probably will need more regulation going forward, uh, but we do have some already. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Nilofa. Great. Uh, yeah, fascinating. 
Um, all right, so we're pretty well going over still a little bit, but if you like, there's one question for um, Nicholas, and there's one I think to 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 end on a lighter tone. So the first one to to Nicholas is um, has to do with the non-registration of space objects, and that he this is someone obviously who has experienced. I know that registration when it does occur is often delayed and that the USA model registration form is not always used by states. Could you describe any policies or initiatives that USA mm -hmm. is pursuing to promote timely and consistent space object registration? And the last question for all panelists, <laughs> what's your favorite space movie, TV show, <laughs> and why? And that's from Annie Handmer. <laughs> all right, Nicholas, and then we'll end with a round of your favorite space shows. <laughs> yeah, uh, very, very, very quickly, it's a good question, but it, it's a bit complex because uh, according to the registration convention, the only stipulation in terms of, uh, of time is as soon as practicable. And as soon as practicable can, can, can mean a lot, you see. Now, so uh, what, what I uh, suggest is that uh, students that wish to know more about the registration regime, go to the website of the office, check out our registration platform, our online index with uh, multiple information on satellites or space objects that are registered, but also non-registered and what, what, what they actually, what information you can, you can retrieve from there. You will also see that uh, we are now operating since some years with the pre-registration, so to say, documentation where we put up front information we are receiving. But you see, the problem is that we have to uh, disseminate this information in all official languages of the United Nations, the six languages. So there is a delay factor also in the system. But we are doing what we can in order to, to have states, uh, really the registered states, to speed up their registration submissions. But it, it is always a challenge. Thank you. And your favorite TV show or movie on space? Well, Alien One, sorry to say. Alien One is my favorite. Stephen is shocked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, who else? Stephen, Setsuko, what's your Dune. favorite? Oh, Dune. Oh. Dune. Dune, it's my okay. favorite. <laughs> okay, great. Who, who else here? Stephen? Oh, your mic. Jerry, after you, Jerry, because you look like you're about to uh, spring forward. Oh, gosh. Um, I wonder what I look like when I'm about to spring forward. <laughs> uh, it's always hard for me to pick one. Um, I, I love Wall-E very, very much. Um, and uh, I loved Hidden Figures. I loved oh. the book and the movie oh. was fantastic, yeah. uh, Hidden That's Figures. Good. And I know this probably goes against the drill. I love Star Trek before they ruined it with the, the, the first three movies. The original was very good. And I like Star Trek. Um, I think it was the thing that actually inspired me into the whole space law thing that we'd like a world. I mean, we like the movie Star Trek. Uh, sorry, Star Wars, we like the movie, but we like the world Star Trek. Uh, and that's what kind of uh, inspired quite a lot of my career. So I think that's the answer. Golly uh, gosh. Uh, great question, Annie. Um, People often say in these at this time, uh, are you a Star Wars or a Star Trek person? Uh, well, I agree with uh, Jerry, I'm a Star Trek person. And when you look at Star Trek, the original Star Treks, they were extraordinary, they were revolutionary, they, they were pioneering things there uh, in, those, uh, in, that, in, in those initial series you thought could never happen, and they are happening now. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's the extraordinary thing. Um, so Star Trek, yes, but but um, I'm a bit um, of, a, of, a, of a sort of traditionalist here. I cannot go beyond 2001 A Space Odyssey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the music, yeah. the, system, uh, the cinematography, uh, and also the idea that, you know, it was a statement about uh, so many things. I mean, people know, for example, in, in 2001, the, the name of the computer was HAL, H-A-L, do people know why it was called HAL? If you think of what's the next letter in the alphabet after H, it is I. After A, it is B. And after L, it is M. So it was a statement. Yeah, it was a statement. Oh, I I mean, remembering the time, it, this was a movie in, oh golly, I can't remember when it was, but a long time ago. When 60s, IBM, I think. Yeah, IBM. 
So it was a statement, um, uh, you know, a, a subliminal statement perhaps about technology and, and all of that. Um, so I think 2001 for me, but but I'm with you on Star Trek. Uh, yeah. Alien One, uh, oh, Nicholas, I would never have picked you for an Alien One person. I'm not <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many eternal questions in there, you know, I mean, they come to this planet and discover the ship, you know, that's, that's, that's a masterpiece. <laughs> Thanks. This, this is great. Well, I have to say that I'm also a Trekkie. Um, I of the generation of the original TV series and, you know, was a great fan of Dr. Spock or Mr. Spock. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but also 2001, I think it's a classic. And uh, so I agree with you, Stephen, on that. Thanks for that question. And to, to all our participants, I know there are so many questions and I apologize. Uh, we just don't have the time to answer them all. They're wonderful questions. Uh, but I have to say, I cannot tell you how delighted I am. And I know our participants are that there is such a strong interest uh, and, and many have stuck uh, with us until the going way over time. And what that shows me, if I have to make a very quick conclusion, that you know, space law is alive and well. Um, there's a lot more to do. Uh, I certainly am very inspired by this. And I think this is something that we will continue looking at. And I cannot thank our participants enough for joining us and the expertise they bring. And I know there's so much more. So I think we will have to make this a sequel as well, part two, <laughs> and have you all come back. Uh, so again, thanks to all the participants, all of you who joined us. And I'm gonna turn over to Yvette who will um, uh, close the session uh, formally. Yvette, floor is over to you. Thank you, Dr. Oral. The recording of this event will be available on the Center for International Law's website and on our YouTube channel. The CIL will be holding our next conference on February 4th, titled COVID-19 Cross-Sector Interlinkages and Public International Law. To find out more about this webinar and the CIL's other upcoming events or activities, you can join our mailing list, which can be found on our website or follow us on social media. A big thank you again to our speakers and attendees today, and we will end our webinar here. Goodbye.